program today. Um, we will be interviewing Grady Grissom and Tammy Verkaterin, which will focus on bird conservation and working ranch lands. I'm Laura Quattrini, one of stewardship, the stewardship team's habitat coordinators, and I've been with Bird Conservancy about uh, nearly 12 years. And um, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. So I'm honored to be leading this interview with two amazing bird conservationists. Um, before I get to their introductions, uh, we'd love to know more about you. Where are you from? How many people are watching with you? Um, what's your favorite bird? If you want to type that in the chat box, um, that would be wonderful. That's how we'll be communicating with folks uh, at first. And if you are a little unsure of where the chat box is, I can run you through um, Zoom some of the Zoom uh, mechanisms. So if you look down in at the um, ribbon for the, the Zoom um, functions, um, you can see the chat box down here and you click on that and um, you can type in to everyone what uh, some of your answers might be. Um, I do want to remind people that um, because of the technology that we deal with and um, you know maybe some Wi-Fi or internet connections might run a little slow if you can all keep yourself muted um, which is this little microphone icon right there and also keep yourselves um, uh, your webcams off as well. Um, let's see, if you do need to exit the full screen um, to be able to view other things on your computer, there is, you can press escape or um, there is an exit screen um, button also. Um, so again, we may have some internet uh, connection issues. So um, if, if that's the case, just bear with us and we'll, we'll get back um, going with the interview. Um, a little bit about Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that conserves birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and stewardship. Our work radiates from the Rockies to the Great Plains to Mexico and beyond. Um, we monitor and identify population trends. We research habitat needs. We engage landowners and managers in wildlife and habitat stewardship and we inspire audiences of all ages to be better stewards of the land. And you can learn more about Bird Conservancy at www.birdconservancy.org. And I first, it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Tammy Verkaterin. Uh, Tammy earned her bachelor's degree in wildlife management in 1995 from Michigan State University, and she has her master's degree from University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she studied sandhill cranes. Uh, she began working for Bird Conservancy, which was then called Colorado Bird Observatory in 1999. Um, as a specialist in uh, GIS, and she did landowner outreach for the Prairie Partners Program. Since then, she, she has served as uh, Prairie Partners Coordinator and Outreach Director, um, and she has been serving as our fearless leader, our Executive Director, since 2009. Uh, oop, I think, okay. Yep, went too far. Um, before I introduce Grady, um, for those of you who don't remember what Prairie Partners, what the Prairie Partners program was, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. It was formed in 1996 by then Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory to conserve birds and the habitat they depend on. Our staff realized that because over 70% of the Great Plains was privately owned, which are the, the white areas on the upper map, um, it means that private landowners are the key to prairie bird conservation. And our goal was to build a coalition of voluntary landowners and land managers who are actively involved in the conservation of lands important to prairie birds. This continues to be our goal for our stewardship program today, and we accomplish it through developing partnerships with other natural resource professionals. We do outreach to the public and private landowners to increase awareness about birds and their habitat requirements, and we provide technical assistance to landowners and land managers on how to incorporate birds into their management plans to enhance habitat. And we have 
uh, about a dozen private lands wildlife biologists who service areas across the Great Plains and Intermountain West, um, as you can see from the, the lower right hand map. It is also my pleasure to introduce Grady Grissom. Uh, Grady has been a manager and partner at Rancho Largo Cattle Company east of Walsenburg, Colorado since 1995. Rancho Largo is a 14,000 acre ranch where the fundamental philosophy is maximum ecosystem health equals maximum ranching, ranching profit, which we're going to talk more about today. Grady received a bachelor's degree in geology from Princeton University in 1984. He worked on ranches in Eastern Colorado till 1987 when he returned to graduate school to receive his PhD in geology at Stanford University and worked as a farrier in the San Francisco Bay Area until 1995. I do want to introduce one last person, Tyler Cash. Um, thank you, Tyler. Tyler's uh, one of our education, environmental educators who's helping behind the scenes with running the Zoom experience and fielding any of your chat questions. So again, if you do have any questions for Grady or Tammy as we're going through the interview, um, please type them in the chat box. Okay, so on with the interview. Um, welcome, both of you. Uh, Tammy, for the first question, um, a long time ago in a landscape not so far away, you were a biologist on the road trying to make inroads with landowners. And I'm always fascinated with the stories that you, and experiences that you had um, when you first started working with the stewardship program. And I was hoping you could give the listeners a quick description of what you did to reach landowners and what your successes were like. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Grady, and all of you for joining us today. Um, I thought I'd just give a start out with a little more history on the Prairie Partners program. So under the founding director, Mike Carter, the staff had a brainstorming session and was really just trying to talk about what are some of the greatest opportunities and needs for bird conservation in the West. And grassland birds really bubbled to the surface, um, recognizing they were in decline, the majority of the habitat that they need are on private lands and the conservation needs because of their annual life cycle needs spans three countries, Canada, the US and Mexico. So that's where the concept of Prairie Partners was born. Um, and we really understood that we need to know more about these grassland birds, where they are, what their habitat needs are. And we also need to get out there and visit and work with and talk with landowners, ranchers and farmers. So. That's how I started in 1999. I jumped in my car with my gazetteer, drove to Wyoming. I had historic records of burrowing owl locations. And I literally drove thousands of miles and looked for burrowing owls and recorded where I saw them and then looked for homes nearby and just had conversations with the ranchers about the burrowing owls, about prairie dogs, about land management and just really started to get a sense for the people, the places, um, and just the opportunities out there. And I slept in my car in different state parks and different city parks and really was taken in by the landowners. Um, I realized to really get excited about birds and talk to them, I needed to understand more about ranching. You know, I grew up understanding the importance of private lands, but I didn't grow up um, with a ranching background. So I jumped in and I went to cattle brandings. They tried to put me inside, help and prepare for the food. They realized I wasn't very good at that. So they stuck me back outside. So I was helping with moving the cattle, helping with branding the calves um, and just really getting immersed in that way of life. And it was pretty phenomenal. Um, I also was fixing fences pulling wells to help so that they had uh, water for the cattle. Um, so that kind of full immersion just really helped me admire the community spirit out there and that amazing connection to the land. And it just afforded me opportunities to talk to landowners, learn about challenges and opportunities they face, how they view the land. And then also where I could, I'd sprinkle in different information about grassland birds. So, it started out in just sleeping in my car and having conversations, recognizing that a lot of those grassland birds were just birds. They didn't have identities or names. 
So that really inspired us to create one of our first outreach tools, um, which you're fully aware of, Laura, as you've helped distribute thousands of them, uh, the Pocket Guide to Prairie Birds. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, you had a huge bird book that had hundreds of species versus a pocket guide fit right in their pocket, easy to use and reference, and really focused on the birds that they were more likely to see in their grasslands or right up around their home. And that just got us having more conversations. When I'd be out there, I'd see they'd have boards floating in their stock tanks as a way to minimize loss of wildlife, but the boards got waterlogged. So we came up with a win-win opportunity. We developed a stock tank ladder with the producers. They designed it, and then the future farmers of America and different local groups helped produce them. And it was a way to improve water quality and minimize loss of wildlife in stock tanks. That evolved then into workshops, which is uh, where I got to know Grady better and then habitat projects. And now to that great map that you showed in our network of private lands biologists that are a collaborative of partners across the West. So we built relationships. We took time can, to listen. Go can ahead. you tell us a little more about how you came to meet Grady? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Grady, Shortly after a ranching for profit workshop, um, I was able to go out and he invited me to visit his ranch. And I went out with another Prairie Partners staff and we just started to visit. And he toured us around his property, which was beautiful. We got to see different birds and point them out to Grady. He pointed out to us how he viewed the land, what he was looking at for indicators of health, Western wheatgrass to just uh, gen general grassland diversity. And as we talked about challenges that people were facing, an aging generation, land prices, um, fluctuating markets, we talked about the idea of Grady hosting a workshop. We had started a workshop series with Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, and had partners like the Natural Resources Conservation Service and US Fish and Wildlife Service and many NGO partners would come together and a landowner would host it like Grady did. And the idea was, let's go in their backyard. Let's go in their familiar community and let's have honest conversations and just figure out how we can really start that conversation for conservation and build trust and build momentum. And what we saw with landowners like Grady is then we'd see contagious conservation afterwards. People would start following up with partners and get involved in different practices and projects. We got momentum for the Colorado Birding Trail, an opportunity for landowners to showcase the amazing birds and other wildlife their lands have. And it ultimately led to a project on Grady's as well with Applia Conservation. Yeah, uh, I, I know that, Grady, for your first question, it's going to be kind of loaded um, and it kind of, um, is also helping to answer a question that our stewardship program has had for a long time in, in how do you engage with landowners and how do you start bringing them into that bird conservation or habitat conservation world. Um, so can you tell us how you were or who you were as a ranch manager or a ranch owner back then when you met Tammy and how did you view your land? Um, in addition to that, what was going through your mind when you first met Bird Conservancy staff? So I, I think the timing of when I met Tammy and became aware of the Bird Conserv Conservancy was perfect. I was a struggling young manager. I'd been here three or four years with a focus exclusively on cattle and production uh, and, and I was in a transition to focusing on the land. And, and what drove that transition was, was economic losses. So in, in those early years of management, I had a lot of experience of the day-to-day -day things that a rancher does to take care of cattle, take care of infrastructure and those things. But I didn't have experience with higher level decisions like stocking rate. And so I landed here as a young inexperienced manager and and immediately thought you know we efficiency is the key here we we have a fairly small ranch uh and and we want this ranch to support a family and pay a mortgage uh and so so we have some those overhead costs and and we've got to be efficient in order to meet those and on paper 
every time you add an animal on the land, you sit down with a piece of paper and you say, well, if we run this many cows, every time we add a cow, we're not adding more overhead. That cow is going to help us cover those overhead costs. And, and that's the sort of focus on efficiency of stocking rate that, that got me in trouble. I, I, I knew we were trying to run it at a high stocking rate, but I, I thought, you know, we can, we can force it to work. And at, at the time when I met Tammy, I was, was in that zone of realization that, I couldn't force the land to do anything and that my focus shouldn't be efficiency or my cattle. My focus should be, should be the land. And, and so, and I, I'd gotten that economic message that uh, when, when you have too many cattle out there, they're competing for that feed resource. And so your animal performance declines and you can't be profitable with, without optimal animal performance. So I was, I was in that, that transition beginning to focus on the land. And, and when, I, when I met Tammy and, and the people from the Bird Conservancy, I was, I was very open to the idea that uh, the conservation community was taking an interest in private lands and wanted to, to partner with landowners to improve habitat. And I was realizing that uh, ecosystem health, that thing you mentioned earlier, Laura, the, the key to profit in any grassland enterprise is ecosystem health. And, and so I, I was open to uh, working with the Bird Conservancy. And, and then the second part of your question, uh, my initial reactions towards, towards Tammy, uh, uh, they were dominated by, by her respect for what ranchers are and what they do. And, and Tammy mentioned uh, spending time on ranches. And I don't think you can understand ranching until you do that. My definition of a rancher is someone who at some point in their life scrapes all their pennies together, makes a down payment on a piece of land, and they do that because they want a certain lifestyle. And then they spend the rest of their life trying to, trying to pay that mortgage. And, and it was clear to me when I first met Tammy that she understood that dynamic. And so I was absolutely open to working with the Bird Conservancy. Yeah, uh, clearly there's a lot of decisions to be made when um, creating management plans for a property. And it's definitely something that it's part of our training process for our new um, private lands wildlife biologists that come that are hired by Bird Conservancy is you really need to, in order to make inroads with landowners and truly have a, a trusting uh, relationship, you have to understand their point of view. So um, over the years, Grady, can you describe um, how your behaviors or attitudes towards conservation has shifted since you first met Bird Conservancy? Uh, I think my, my attitudes and behaviors have, have shifted on two levels. Uh, the, the first, at the, at the level of the ranch itself, as I described, I was in around 2000, I was realizing that, that the path to profit was ecosystem health. And so I took a deep dive into the ecology of grazing and, and began to realize that the high plains where we are um, evolved with large grazing ruminants, the American bison, and that those large grazing ruminants are in fact a key part of ecosystem function. Their, their primary function is mineral cycling. And by that, I mean, uh, putting lignin plant material back into the soil. And so we began to look for ways that, that we could use our cattle as a tool uh, and, and make them fill the niche of, of the American bison, which is, which is now gone. And, and by beginning to view our cattle as a tool, that was sort of a first step in adaptive management uh, and, and creating ecological goals and then trying to find ways that, that our grazing could help us meet our ecological goals. And then the, the second level uh, where my behaviors and attitudes have changed is, is more on a philosophical level. So I, I wasn't raised on a ranch. I was raised in the suburbs. Uh, and as a young person, I spent a lot of time on my grandparents' ranches, but I also spent a lot of time climbing in the mountains. And, and I think my surroundings, the people I was around, uh, my view of the mountains was, was an environmentalist view. I, I felt like 
you know, our wild places need to be uh, separated from people and protected from people. Whereas in spending time on my grandparents' ranches, I didn't see grasslands as wild places. I, I saw grasslands in through a utilitarian lens that grasslands are meant to produce food for people. And, and I think in the last 20 years as a manager at Rancho Largo, uh, I, I realized that, that those views uh, had fundamental problems. And, and first off, grasslands are wild places. And, and secondly, the environmental perspective of the world wants to separate people from the land. And, and I've come to realize that, that the conservation view of the world, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold especially, um, and, and Leopold was such a great writer that he sort of has re-educated the, our generation that uh, people have to be part of conservation and you can't separate people out. And, and so on a philosophical level, I've, I've come to view grasslands as a prime example of the failures of env environmentalism, that we need to have wild places uh, that are healthy and can feed a growing human population. That's point on. Um, so as, as your conservation philosophy has grown over the years, um, you've been implementing um, new practices on your ranch um, that also benefit birds um, as well as help you achieve your your bottom bottom dollar for your ranching business. Um, it doesn't sound like it's been completely easy to implement. So um, can you list off some of the practices that that you have implemented and what some of the difficulties might be in doing that? So so I can definitely list some practices, but I think it's, it's uh, absolutely critical to, to view those practices in the context of adaptive management and, and having an ecological goal and trying to figure out how your practices are gonna move you towards your ecological goal, which as I've said several times, moves you towards profit. And, and so I'll, I'll sort of, I may not actually list practices, but sort of give you a rundown of, of how some of our thought processes changed as we adapted, as we monitored results of grazing and then adapted our practice. So first off, we realized that we wanted to make our cattle mimic um, the impact of buffalo on the, ran on the land. And that meant that they probably had to move around. So we needed some infrastructure in order to make that happen. And the we put in some electric fence and, and added some water points so that we had the ability to control the, the, the timing, intensity, duration, and seasonality of our grazing. And, and the, I think the first thing we learned when we started watching our cattle interact with the land was that in a semi-arid environment, we get about 10 to 12 uh, inches of precip per year. Um, the land needs a long recovery from grazing. We were going back to the same pastures sometimes 40 or 60 days after we were there, and it was as if we'd never left. So the, the first adaptation was that we went to, to long recovery periods, and essentially each pasture only got grazed once a year. And, and then we began to realize that the seasonality of grazing was critical. If, if we grazed the same pasture at the same time every year, the cattle were eating the same plants in their same stage of development. And, and that, that doesn't work for the plants. Cattle are very selective grazers. They, they, at different times of year, they eat different plants and then they pick plants based on, on where they are in the plant's growth cycle. So, so we began to make sure that we didn't return to the same pastures at the same time. And, and then uh, I think, a one of our key realizations, so our initial goals were about plant diversity. And, and we realized that if we had cool season plants, our cattle could eat green forage for a longer period during the year. And, and the link there to profitability was pretty obvious. But as we began to, to find ways to increase plant diversity, we realized that insects, birds, fungi, bacteria, that diversity comes in, in sort of a big lump. And, and so like birds scatter seed and if we want uh, 
different plants to move to, if we want to cultivate new plants in different parts of our landscape, we need a diverse bird population. Insects pollinate. So if plants going to reproduce, we need the pollinators. And, and so we, we began to, to realize that our our goal of diversity needed to in, involve diversity at all levels. And, and one of the offshoots of that in, as we tried to find ways to, to increase our diversity of birds was that birds need vegetative structure. And, and that just means uh, plants juxtaposed in the landscape of different height. And, and some vegetative structure is inherent sort of soil driven you have places that have shrubs and places that only have grass, but our cattle can play a role there. Um, if one pasture was recently heavily grazed and another pasture hasn't been grazed for a year, um, you're gonna have tall grass juxtaposed against short grass. And, and that's something that is important to birds. And in fact, we, we instituted a practice where we, we would stay out of, as we move through the landscape, we would skip certain pastures so that they wouldn't get grazed for two years. And, and that was initially an effort to increase structure for birds. Then from that, we then realized that certain plants like four wing saltbush need a two year deferral in order to get going in, in a pasture. So, so our, our efforts to, to recruit plants turned into efforts to recruit birds and then fed back again uh, to our plant recruiting. Uh, another realization was that we had playas on the ranch that were an untapped resource for diversity. And this came about largely through conversations with, with people at the Bird Conservancy. And so we, we joined Bird Conservancy and partnered in a project to, to fill in the pits in the middle of the playas and, and restore the ecological function of those playas. So migrating birds need water spread out over vegetation and that creates an explosion in bugs and then becomes the perfect stopping point for migrating birds. So we partnered with Bird Conservancy. That project is, is described in a, in a blog on our website, rancholargo.com, goes through how we restored the playas and, and what the ecological response was. And finally, uh, I'll throw in one more realization for us and, and that is in regards to prairie dogs. Um, we realized in, in recent years that prairie dogs are sort of an untapped uh, way to create diversity. And so we've, we've quit trying to control prairie dogs. We now try to find ways to make them move around the landscape as our cattle do and, and juxtapose those areas of short ecological structure with areas of taller structure. And, and so all those, all those, it's not like that's a chronological list of things we did or, or if you use practice A, it leads to results B. Uh, that's sort of a, hopefully, a, a description of how adaptive management works. And, and it's, it's, I think, in regards to the Bird Conservancy, the thing I love about the Bird Conservancy is they didn't want me to, to try to help, oh, we need to fix this problem. We need this species of bird to improve. The Bird Conservancy is about healthy habitat. That, and, and when you have healthy, diverse habitat, you have a, a healthy, diverse suite of birds. And, and so our goals and our adaptive management work perfectly with, with the sort of core philosophy of the Bird Conservancy. Yeah, I remember, um sometime in the past, you mentioned to a, a group of people that you weren't really a rancher for cattle, but you were more of a, 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 a grassland producer. You were a grass farmer. Um, so definitely looking at it at, on the landscape scale. Um, so it, like I said, and like as you described, I mean, the decisions that you make are not easy and there are difficulties in, you know, when you defer, grazing on a, a pasture, it assumes a, some amount of risk. Um, and so my next question is for both of you, despite these difficulties, um, it's still important for you to be a conservation rancher. Um, 
And for Tammy, Bird Conservancy continues to try to reach more and more private landowners because it is important for conservation, for bird conservation to be reaching these landowners. So why is that important? Why, why do landowners, why should landowners continue to be involved um, to kind of try to lead towards that conservation ranching? Um, and then you know, in the respect of how ranching and birds are connected. So I'll, I'll jump in, Laura. Um, so the reality that we had from the get-go was just private landowners like you have already talked about in Grady, they own the majority of the habitat out there. So basically private lands is ground zero for grassland bird conservation. So that's why from the beginning, we've always taken a human-centered approach. We really wanted to get out, understand what was happening in the landscape, recognize there's not one size that fits all. So different folks are in different places. How do we help meet people where they are um, and build common ground from there? And the reality is that, you know, historically it was bison, today it's cattle, bison, goats, you name it, but birds evolved with grazing. And birds also serve a vital role in the environment. They disperse seeds, they eat insects. And as you can see on the chart you have here, at the end of the day, the pastures um, that Grady has that have cattle in them in you know, March and April, then he's more likely to see mountain plover in there, horned larks. Um, the pastures that have a little more structure because maybe he hasn't grazed them yet, then you're gonna get some of your birds like uh, Western meadowlark. And then areas where maybe he's deferred that pasture, we'll see cats and sparrows, We'll kind of see lark buntings across the mix, but the reality is you can see those broad spectrums of habitat that those birds use because it also depends on their life stage. So they might be attracted to early disturbed areas where cattle have just been for foraging and then more cover for nesting and then something different to rear their young. So it's having that great patchwork of habitat out there that happens as you can rotate your cattle and that you're looking at the land features and the uh, land prescriptions to know when it's time time to move and ultimately getting that nice great mix of grasses and forbs out there. So ultimately because the birds are migrating here and they're choosing Brady's Ranch or Bob's Ranch or Sally's Ranch, they're, in, they're indicators of the health out there and the diversity in the system process. And birds and ranching go together. Healthy birds habitat is also aligned with clean water, clean air, they need good grasslands, good wetland habitats to support their different life stage needs. And Grady, for the health of his cattle, like you said, he grows grass. So he needs healthy forage for his livestock. And just kind of going back to those initial conversations with Grady and multiple landowners across Colorado and Wyoming and Nebraska and other states as well, um, if you don't take care of the land, it won't take care of you. And at the end of the day, if we don't have our stewards out there on the land, then we don't have healthy, resilient grasslands for our birds and for our human communities. So just really always have to want to emphasize the important role that um, private landowners and managers um, have and make um, for the future of grassland conservation and birds too. Grady, did you want to follow so, up on uh, that? Yeah, Tammy essentially answered that question for me. Uh, the, the, that fundamental philosophy that ecological health drives profit in grazing enterprises, that, that's the core of it. I, but it, maybe this is a chance, just a second. Hopefully I got that turned off. I, I think... <laughs> I think this is a, a chance to maybe answer the second part of your question before that I didn't answer uh, about the hardships. And the hardest part of becoming a, a conservation rancher is that initial change in paradigm, that, that initial change in focus from your cattle to your land. And, and once I went through that, everything else sort of fell into place. But I think part of the reason that I continue as a conservation rancher is 
is and continue to work with the Bird Conservancy is to help other ranchers go through that transition. And so this, the stewardship program with Bird Conservancy, uh, we try to get ranchers to engage in practices, but the, the practice is sort of the gateway drug. What, what you hope is, is that that rancher will go through that fundamental mindset conversion and, and realize that uh, if this practice helps the ecology and ultimately that helps my bottom line, but the, the, the next step is for that, that rancher to sort of take ownership of that and say, and say, you know what, I, and, and ranchers are a huge untapped resource in this regard. If we could get more ranchers to, to take that, and it, to take that mindset, um, their ability to innovate is incredible. Just a quick example. Uh, there's a guy south of Kim, uh, and, and he has certainly gone through that mindset transition, and, and he was looking for ways to control cedars, and, and fire is, is sort of one way to do that, but he could not get burn permits in under conditions where he could truly control cedars with fire, and so his innovation was and, he, and, and this, this is the untapped resource I'm talking about. He realized that in a drought, he would end up with a big flush of tumbleweeds and he wouldn't graze the south side of it, southwest side of any cedars he wanted to control. Those tumbleweeds go, would go to maturity, blow into the cedars. And then at a time when it was cooler and he could actually get his burn permit, he could torch those, seed, torch those tumbleweeds and end up controlling his cedars. And it's, it's those little, it's those kind of things that the guy who's on the land can figure out and, and find those, those little keys that, that make conservation projects actually work. And, and so the, the I, I'm still a conservation rancher and I'm still engaged with Bird Conservancy with the hope that we can convert more and more ranchers to that fundamental mindset. Yeah, Grady, you've been an amazing spokesperson for Bird Conservancy, um, as well as a lot of the other landowners we work with. But you in particular, you are on the Colorado Birding Trail. Um, you have been a board member for Bird Conservancy uh, for several years. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and then in 2017, you actually won the uh, Leopold Conservation Award um, for ranching. Um, so we can see that birds are important to you. Um, what did winning the Leopold Award mean to you and um, to be recognized for your actions as a, a conservation rancher? So the, the, the Leopold Award was certainly a, a milestone for me. Uh, it, it, I think it made me realize that, that what we do here is appreciated and important. Um, but there, there's sort of a backstory there, and, and that is that uh, through the years, as I've worked hard at understanding grazing ecology and, and using my cattle as a tool in the landscape, uh, I was being told that, that moving my cattle through the landscape could not improve the ecology. And I was, I was being told that by um, a, a portion of the research community, the academic research community in, in uh, rangeland sciences. And, and so I, ultimately what the, the conflict there comes down to the fact that a, in complex biological systems, there's so many variables that, that, that uh, controlled experiments cannot imitate what adaptive managers do. And, and so that like the example I just gave of the guy south of Kim is a perfect example. The literature essentially says that you, you can't use fire to control cedars larger than about two or three feet tall. Well, that guy figured out a way to control big cedars by letting tumbleweeds blow in there and having the fuel to do it. And, and so he was taking advantage of a certain opportunity that a controlled experiment can't imitate. And, and so it, I've worked hard uh, 
in the last 15 to 20 years to try to mediate that conversation between the research community and the management community. And, and at times, uh, that was hard. Uh, uh, being told that what I know in my heart is working isn't working made it a struggle. Uh, and so the, the Leopold Award was a, was a way for me to realize that my efforts in that regard also were, were appreciated by the conservation community. Yeah, and we were thrilled that you did receive that. Um, and now you're running a fundraiser for Bird Conservancy through Rancho Largo Cattle Company. And I was hoping you could tell the listeners a little bit more about that fundraiser. Yeah, so we uh, just in the last few years have, have begun to direct market our beef product. And, and you know, we spent 20 some years uh, fighting that steep part of the learning curve on and, and poking a stick at a, at a biologic system, trying to figure out uh, how to get the results we wanted. And, and we finally reached a point where we thought um, that, that we needed to be out of the commodity beef market and, and try to educate the general public on, on what ranchers do and what cooperative conservation and, and people like the Bird Conservancy do. And, and so we, we started to direct market our beef and, and just in the last couple of months, we've, we've worked with the Bird Conservancy uh, and, and put out a grill box. And, and our idea was to try to do two things. One was to educate uh, the general public about what cooperative conservation is and how it works. Two, to, to uh, provide a, a quality regenerative beef product for people. And, and three, to, to su support the Bird Conservancy. And um, for those, for uh, the participants on the interview today, um, you can see on the presentation, if you go to www.rancholargo.com, you can place your order for this grill box. And I, I was talking to Tammy and Grady earlier, I don't have a, a deep freezer to order a large quantity, so um, I'm working on that. <laughs> but I've heard that the beef, ground beef does not last long because it's so good. All right, uh, Grady, aside from your day-to-day -day management, um, what are your hopes for the future of your ranch and what plans do you have? So uh, on a small scale, it goes back to my definition of a rancher. Uh, I, I want to continue to make a living here and, and get the mortgage paid before I die. And, that seems like a small thing, but it's it's um, it's at the core of of what every rancher lives for. On the bigger scale, uh, I I've become much more interested in the sort of local food movement and and the concept of regenerative agriculture. And I I'm not a big fan of the word sustainable. I'm I, I'm much more favor regenerative. In my mind the idea of sustainable ag or sustainable anything leads us down a path where, um, for instance, maybe we're just measuring everything by CO2 footprint. And, and whereas regenerative means that we're looking at an ecosystem and trying to find ways that, that people can in fact improve that ecosystem. And, and so I, I much prefer the word regenerative ag and, and in, in reference to local food, uh, I, I go back to post-World War II uh, or actually go to pre-World War II and, and our, our food distribution system in the U.S. was largely a, a local food distribution. Then during World War II, we end up rationing food and, and we made some decisions based on the fact that we had to ration food that we never wanted to do that again. And, and so one of, the, one of those decisions was to, to provide subsidies for food production. And, and one, of the, one of the offshoots of that sort of unintended consequences when you subsidize something like we started subsidizing grain, 
uh, you end up with too much of it. So what are you going to do with it? Uh, we, we created a whole industry, the confined animal feeding industry. And, and that's maybe a small example, but in the bigger picture, since World War II, our agricultural production has been focused almost exclusively on efficiency, uh, kind of like I was in the first few years here. And, and, and that focus on efficiency, I think, needs to change. And, and the, the consumers are driving that change. They want uh, regenerative food at least sustainable food. And, and so in the, in the bigger picture, I, I wanna be a part of that. Uh, I don't think we can go exclusively to a local food model. I think the, the situation with COVID shows us that we need to have a more local component, but I, I, I don't think we can feed the world without big ag, but, but I, don't, I don't view quote big ag as a bad thing. Uh, I, I think if, if consumers continue to push for regenerative ways to produce our food, big ag can function and, and feed the world and we can increase that component of local food. So sort of big picture, um, those are the things I'm looking at going forward. Yeah, and like you said, right now, especially right now, it's a great time to be thinking about where your food comes from. Tammy. Yep. How about you? What are your hopes for the future of conservation? Well, my hope for the future um, is 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 bright, but it's big. And you know, <laughs> Grady's obviously worked with many different partners um, across the landscape, and he's been a voice for conservation and the ranching community through. Um, multiple folks, including the Covera Coalition and Bird Conservancy and Nature Conservancy um, and so many more. And the reality is we're all doing a lot for grassland conservation. But when you look across the geography from Canada, the US to Mexico, um, our measures of success are not headed in the right direction. Our grassland birds are in decline. Our acres of grass are in decline. Our aquifers are being depleted. Um, so we need to think differently. Um, what I call more of a shotgun approach of how we're doing conservation. Need to figure out how to be more precise and more accurate and more um, landscape wide. So we've been working with a collaborative of partners over the last two years um, to pull together the Central Grasslands Roadmap Summit. And we are going to have voices from landowners and indigenous communities, as well as industry and non-government organizations and federal and state and academia and foundations, all talking about what does the future of grasslands look like and how do we build resilient human and wildlife communities for the future. And, you know, you see this stat here. There was a recent publication in Science that was out this fall that we were a part of, and it's about the uh, loss of three billion birds over the last 50 years. And the biggest losers, unfortunately, in some of that are grass birds. One in four of those three billion birds gone are grassland birds. And we don't have another 50 years to figure this out. So the urgency is there, but so are the opportunities. So really excited about um, this this effort, we kick off with a series of speakers in July and then some deep dives on discussions. We plan to roll up this roadmap um, by the end of summer and then give it a test for the next year and figure out where did it give us clear direction and we really feel like it's gonna make a strong lasting impact for grasslands and where did we go in the ditch and where do we need to fix that and clean it up. So we'll come together as a community, hopefully in August of 2021 to to get that to the finish line after we've tested it out. So um, as we, I know we have to wrap up here soon, I just really appreciate everyone tuning in and I hope you really heard the importance of, you know, we have a dynamic landscape out there. We've got a diverse community of people that as you're out there and thinking, it's important to listen. I think we're really good at talking, but it's important to listen to folks, get different perspectives. And ultimately, it's at the hands of the landowners and managers, decisions they make that will affect conservation for the future. And ultimately, it has to be economically viable. So 
as we work together and we build synergies and we make our impact bigger and more long lasting, um, we will always emphasize the people out there. Great, thank you. Um, that was my last question. And I do want to get to our um, listeners' questions also. But thank you to both of you um, for continuing to bring light to private lands conservation. Um, Grady, many landowners don't want to be in the limelight. So it's amazing to have you be a spokesperson for us um, on behalf of the birds. And Tammy, um, you work tirelessly. Um, you always amaze me um, as you continue to raise awareness for birds and um, move the conservation needle. Um, one last thing before we get to folks' questions, um, stay in touch with us. Um, visit our Facebook page, our website. You can email us. Um, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies education programs are brought to you by a dedicated team of educators who work every day to connect people with uh, people of all ages with uh, nature and birds. Um, this past spring, we did suffer a 30% loss in our program revenue, um, which does help to cover salary for our educators. So if you are in a position to help us keep education programs like this going, um, especially during these uncertain times, please support us at birdconservancy.org forward slash donate. And thank you so much for participating in today's virtual program. And now I'm gonna ask Tyler to give me a hand and help um, voice some of the questions that were um, typed in the chat box. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, so we do have a, co a couple questions for Grady. Uh, the first question that came through was from Heather. Uh, she said her family's interested in buying a small ranch and doing exactly what you say, focus on the land. How do we find the right property? And how do we ensure we are protecting the land and animals while not going bankrupt? <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of guidance. <laughs> uh, how do you find the right property? Um, I guess that my thought there is, goes back to my definition of a rancher, which is, is it's someone that wants a certain lifestyle. So, you've got to find a property that, that fits the lifestyle you envision. And, and then <clears throat> how do you, how do you make it work without going broke? That's, that's the tough one. I, I think it goes back to what we've been saying. Uh, sometimes your, your efforts towards a healthy ecosystem uh, may delay the financial returns but that's not always true. But they, they, in some cases, that is true. But ultimately, the, the key to surviving in any grazing enterprise is, is ecological health. And, and so, uh, and I guess the last thing on, in that regard is uh, economy of scale. So uh, this ranch is 14,000 acres, very limited rainfall, though. So, so this ranch... Um, if you average rainfall and, and look at say a 20 year period, probably runs 70 acres per cow. So it would run roughly 200 cows. Uh, the average profit per cow, and, and these are cattle facts numbers, pretty well researched numbers. The average profit per cow in the last 20 years in the US is about 35 or $40 per cow. So, so call it 40. Uh, that's, that's not much cash per cow. That economy of scale is, is a huge, huge thing. And, and that's what drove me to, to financial struggles in the first few years was forcing the economy of scale to work. So that, I think ultimately you have to be realistic about that economy of scale. And, and I had to go back to shoeing horses at a certain point uh, because this ranch just wasn't big enough to to carry the whole load. Thank you, Grady, for, for your wisdom. Uh, we have one more, one more question from Jennifer. Uh, she says, how important is the conversation between ranchers and conservation, about conservation ranching? Uh, and if there's any success stories in chatting with your neighbors and changing their practices or views? Uh, I think the short answer there is, conversations don't carry much weight uh, 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 and th th they're important in that 
it sort of lets my neighbors know what I'm doing. But, but if you're a rancher, your life is, is so dictated by forces that you have no control of, i.e. weather. Um, that you become very conservative in your management changes. You, you don't jump whole hog into things. So what I've seen, seen over the years is uh, what I say doesn't make that much difference to my neighbors and acquaintances. Uh, but when we trade labor and they come here and help me brand my calves in the spring and help me wean my calves in the fall, and they see my cattle and they see my land, uh, that it, it is the results I get that get their attention. And, and I've had a number of people um, who were riding through the pasture to go gather my cattle and, and ask me, so, so you're not running very many cattle. And, and when I answer them and say, no, I'm running quite a few cattle, uh, but the way I do it allows this land to look like it does. That's what gets their attention when they see it for themselves. All right. Thank you, Grady. So those are all the questions we have. So we'll turn it over to, to Laura. Great. Hey, Laura, if I could add to that real quick, but um, I wanted to build a little bit because what we saw when we did the workshop, though, is when we had folks like Grady's land or other lands that were doing practices, the kind of what we call fence line conversations and landowners seeing um, success, that's what really helped um, get more of that energy and momentum going because seeing is believing. Yeah, I know we always absolutely. And then, go ahead, Grady. The the Tammy is exactly right. The, those conversations are critical, and the the bird conservancy model of landowner hosted workshops was brilliant. Uh, th that is the forum where uh, people first know know what I'm doing, see what I'm doing, hear what I'm doing. And then they may not change their actions, but that is what starts them sort of monitoring me. And, and it also is, is a way for them to trust the bird conservancy. When, when people come to, to my land and it's, it's landowner hosted and, and landowner driven, they pay attention. And so Tammy's exactly right. The, the, the workshop model was brilliant. Yep. I, always love looking at our maps where we held the workshops and then worked with landowners afterwards. And it was like, it was always clustered around that one spot of the workshop. So we started calling it contagious conservation. Um, and man, we <laughs> timed that out perfectly. We have one minute left. And I just want to remind folks that anyone can help conserve birds. Um, I know with the, the 3 billion birds gone initiative, um, if you go to 3billionbirds.org, um, there are seven simple actions that anyone can, can do to help um, conserve birds. So please check that out. And thank you, Tammy and Grady, very much for giving us your time. Thank you, Tyler, for helping me. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, and um, we did record this interview. So if you want to view it later, you can go to uh, youtube.com. Um, user at RMB, or you can see it on the website or on, on your screen. But um, if you go to birdconservancy.org and then click the YouTube icon, it'll take you there <laughs> rather than me read off the um, address. So, again, thanks so much, and we'll see everyone later. Take care. Happy summer. Thanks again.